da, 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 da. Sometimes guests don't do what you think they're going to do. So now we're live, except I'm on the wrong side. Fix it. Done? What do you done, want no? me to fix it? How about please, would you fix it? No. I mean, hi. Please, co host of the Harry. Backpack Show, my favoritest co host, would you please fix it? The best co host I have. Please, I'll Carrie, would you things. fix it? So we Happy have a show Sunshine today. Hump Day, everyone. Hi, Michelle. Hump Day. Hi, Yay. Michelle. Uh, do we have a second guest? Yes, we do. He oh. was having some internet issues. Um, mm. So we've got two backups in the works. Did you explain to him about how Genevieve ran all the way down the street to fix our internet? I did not. Okay. Well, I don't care. He seemed we, helpful at the time. So this is Dollywood. He's at an office. Like, you know, it's not going to work. So. Yeah, it's Dollywood. That's true. We have Mickey Candle. So I don't care. I mean, everything else is gravy at that point. Um, author of Hood F Feminism, author of Amazon's Abolitionists and Activists. Oh, my gosh. I almost blew it. It's a... Uh, there. It's a uh, graphic novel. There's Pete. So we're going to be fine. We're going to be able to make a show out of this. So I was just saying to Mickey that when I, I went to grab her book, like I searched for hood feminism and it's like good feminism. And no. I'm like, no. But, I mean, it is, but it isn't, you know. So we're going to have funny. a show today. Hold on. Don't go anywhere. Pete, we'll get to you in a bit. You didn't even you, interrupt me that time. You're getting fucked. No, I was being nice. But I listen, I know you also you have to like wander off to parts unknown or something like that. So um, you know, I wanna be I wanna be respectful of your time and your choices. Yeah. And in well. twenty eight minutes, I have to jet in twenty eight minutes. Twenty eight uh, minutes. Uh, I send you the alert first because I want you here, Raul. You're important. That's right. That's right. <laughs> I had some alerts. I was trying to use um I was trying to use the really awesome social media tool, Agora Pulse, to set up all these things. And I was the mistake. There was nothing wrong with the software. I just kept typing the wrong things into it. And then people would tell me about it. And I had to delete like 25 posts. So. Welcome to the Backpack Show, everybody. It's not a tech tip show. We bring you insights into success from unusual places, people you po probably haven't heard from before on kind of the regular business shows. Hello, Fred Faulkner IV. Hello. Lee. Hey, Leslie. Do we want to risk it all and just throw Pete on and see what happens? <laughs> <laughs> no testing whatsoever. We'll here first, but yeah, let's see. I want to know like what's going on with Pete. So is that let's, cool? Let's just okay, at least thanks. test. Let's actually, you know what? Let's do this. Let's bring both on just for a second. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's do it. Let's say hi. You hide your little button. I'll do it. So Mickey was wonderful. Mickey showed up and hello. And first, we had a great chat ahead of time about and all now, sorts of things that have nothing to do with what we're going to ask her about. But that's what we do in the backstage. And now let's risk it. Hi, Pete. Did it work? What I see Pete. Here, we yes. all see him. We're all here live. We could do it. Mm -hmm. We did so, it. This was working. Lori Joe's here. My dad's here. Hi. Um, all right. So what we're going to do is because Carrie has to go uh, a little early, and Carrie begged to have Pete on. Mickey, I'm going to put you backstage. You just so I'll stay can here. I mean, I'm fine with that. Questions, <laughs> and then we'll go back. It would be a little mental to do that, but here we go. P. Like Owens, everybody. Carrie really desperately wanted to get a hold of you, and she really wanted to have this show. So, I'll uh, I'll let her start with the, the first lob of questions, and I'll be so polite. Take you back to one minute and thirty seconds ago when we were on the phone. <laughs> we couldn't get Pete in here. So here's what I was thinking. I live in Tennessee now. I'm from Massachusetts, but people love Dolly Parton here. And Chris, you had just seen a Netflix show about Dolly Parton, a series, and you're like, oh, I love her so much. And years ago, I went to Dollywood. And so all this just got me thinking, oh, man, like, I wonder what's going on with Dollywood right now, because right now, like, people really need some outdoor fun and stuff. But it's kind of it's kind of fraught, everything. So I thought, I'm going to bring Pete Owens on and find out what's going on at Dollywood and how they're keeping people safe and just what's going on with Dolly. Hello. Hi there. How are you? Um, well, Dolly's busy. She's got a new Christmas album and she's got a Christmas movie that's coming out on Netflix and about, well, I don't know, today's uh, Veterans Day. So in nine days, I think, I think it's on 1120. Um, that's called Christmas on the Square. But it is, uh, uh, she's really slammed. Um, but I will tell you that uh, this has been an interesting year for Dollywood and for her businesses. Um, my job is I represent 
her marketing interest in our physical businesses. So the theme park, the water park, our resort business. Uh, we also own multiple dinner theater attractions and some other theaters. And uh, it's been an interesting year. So I'll take you back to March 13th. And on March 13th, uh, we actually were open. Uh, it was sneak peek day for uh, our season pass holders at Dollywood, and we had a great day. Uh, but about noon, we started to have some conversations with Dolly about the um, this thing called COVID and uh, what was happening around the country and around the world and what we thought. And uh, in essence, we came to a group decision that um, – even though we were open and having a successful day, that that would be the day that we open for the season. And that would be the day that we would close temporarily for the season. So at the end of that day, we closed the park and we started working toward uh, ways to be able to manage the safety of our guests and our hosts uh, for um, the time that we reopened. So you fast forward through several months of work and we reopened on June the 15th, uh, both our theme park and our water park. And uh, at that time we had 700 different operational changes that had been made wow. to help uh, solve those two issues. How do we keep our, our host safe primarily? How do, I, how do we keep our, our guests safe? And how do we follow through in uh, what these rules are that really aren't rules, they're guidelines, and they vary state to state. And You're like, Dolly wants you to stay alive, everybody. Right. We're ask. So we- Was there a backlash so we through, and, and those while you're doing the, all this? Like you're a PR me? guy. Was there backlash when you decided to open like at all? Were there people, because I didn't look, but- No backlash time. when we, no backlash when we reopened. Um, lots of backlash for these. Huh. So, you know, wow. you, had, uh, you know, there were folks that really wanted uh, to come in and wanted to wear masks and then, and then folks that did not want to wear masks at all. And that really continued that way through the summer, uh, until we got into, um, say, say just before Labor Day. And then, it's like somebody flipped a switch and maybe people got it um, and they understood why we were limiting access to the park uh, by, you know, the number of folks that we were letting in, why we were strictly enforcing social distancing, why we were acquiring masks, why all of those hand sanitizer stations and sink stations around the park were there. And from about Labor Day on, uh, things just kind of took off. Uh, and unlike uh, our brethren in the theme park industry that are really, really struggling, um, we're actually doing pretty well. I mean, we are just slightly off where we were last year, uh, even wow. with the attendance restrictions. Um, and uh, we feel pretty good about where we are looking toward 2021. Um, it's a, uh, it's been an interesting, um, let's just say we're, we continue to push the boulder up the hill and, and we'll see, uh, and we'll see what happens as we, uh, as this continues to, uh, change on a day-to-day -day basis. Is that a Dollywood um, mask? Can we see it? Are they like branded? Uh, we do have some branded, but um, most of the folks just come in and bring their bring their own. It's fun to see ones that they brand themselves. Oh, fun! <laughs> and and those are and those are those are fun. Um, but I know, would like to see Dolly's. I bet hers is like bedazzled. Um, she has one that she does wear that is kind of the lower part of her face, so it has oh. lip pointed. Oh, that's mark. funny. <laughs> um, and then she does have a couple that are just rhinestoned. And all of those kind of things, but she frankly has not been getting out much. She does. Uh, she has a studio that is attached to uh, one of her uh, one of her cottages on her uh, in a in a compound that she has in Nashville, and uh, 
she's been doing a lot of the things you see. Um, you know, I, I just, uh, a couple of Fridays ago, she did the Graham Norton show. Right. And, and her guys basically built the Graham Norton set in her studio so that she looked like she belonged. And, uh, and they've been doing that for various other things. She's on, uh, she's on Apple TV tomorrow with Oprah and, uh, and then Friday she does a live Q and a on Amazon, uh, music for the, for the album, the Christmas album and some other things. And, uh, she'll be doing it all from her own studio. So Everybody Pete, I have, loves her. I have 8,000 questions for you. And I guess I'll start with, so I have a lot of friends who work at the house of the mouse and very specifically in the parks scenario. So they, a lot of jobs lost, a massive amount, more than people have in their whole company, you know, by far. Uh, and what I what I kept thinking was, you know, it, you know, it's a pretty intense operation. And I imagine you run your operations, you know, differently, obviously, because there's a, there's a different scale and a, and a different intention to going to a place like Dollywood. But what else do you attribute keeping that rolling? I mean, that's it's it's a real hard business. I mean, almost everything you just mentioned that you have control of in your realm is the face to face stuff. It is all the contact points, the dinner theaters and all that. How do you, how, is it just through safety measures? Like what did you do to keep that alive? Well, I mean, I, I think it has to, it, it goes to branding, number one. And I think that we have a really um, strong relationship with our guests. Mm -hmm. I mean, Disney does as well. Um, but it's a different kind of thing. We're right. what in our industry, what I would consider um, a tweener. So the, um, you've got destination parks. So that would be universal Disney, um, uh, maybe sea world or, or Bush gardens, depending on where it is. And then you have regional parks like six flags or, um, you know, uh, Cedar fair parks, things like that. Sure. And we're a tweener. So we're a destination park in a regional market setting. So a lot of things sprung up around Dollywood that make it a little bit more of a destination now, like other kinds of touristy type businesses and things like that. So there's more well, to do there, I guess, than there used to be. Yeah, no, absolutely. And we have a, I mean, we build a four star uh, resort hotel um, that is part of the complex uh, a couple a couple of years ago. Uh, we're actually scheduled on the day that we closed this year to announce uh, expansion to our lodging product that is on hold. So, you know, you look at those particular things, but, you know, to answer your question directly, so Disney has a relationship with its guests and there are a lot of Disney Anna people that are just super passionate. But in a, in a market like say Disney world uh, magic kingdom, that's a rite of passage park. Right. So you go when you visit once when you're a kid or maybe twice if you're a kid and that's it. It's also a lot of their business is managed. Um, they're, they, they're, they really took off uh, on their trajectory when they tapped the South American business market. So um, Brazil in particular, uh, and, you know, the UK market uh, and European market that were coming to visit. Mm -hmm. And when COVID happened, all international travel just shut off. Mm -hmm. So for uh, about half of their year, they don't have any guests. Uh, you know, they just have who's coming in, who lives in the Florida market or, you know, folks that are trying to do that, make it take advantage of that rite of passage visit. So the sure. regional we, nature on the other of your hand, audience. Have a, yeah. I mean, we have a very strong um, group of customers that are season pass holders that are within 200 miles and then additional folks that visit from large metro markets that are around us. I mean, you know, uh, for where Dollywood is in the eastern part of Tennessee, we're, we're within a day's drive of half the population of the United States. So folks, we saw folks this year coming from all over the country, uh, but in particularly down the I-81 
corridor from the the uh, northeast, uh, a lot of folks from upper Midwest, places where their um, their states had been shut down or their states had been highly restricted into areas in which those folks thought they could come down and um, Just visit out. and get, uh, <laughs> let, get, let a, a, get a little bit of um, our Raul man Mike, says he's going to come visit. Come visit. Our man Michael Doherty had a question. He said, uh, you mentioned there were 700-ish points of operation that changed to get this thing running the way it needs to run now. He's wondering, you know, how bad has that affected your industry, which we all know has whacked a lot of people. Mm -hmm. But it, you know, how long-lasting is this going to be after the pandemic? How many of these 700 you know, measures do you think roll back real fast after, or do you think they stay? Uh, I think some of the things that we've done are going to remain. I mean, I think uh, we learned a lot, right? We learned a lot on, uh, um, you know, guest flow. And we learned a lot in regard to, um, you know, exactly uh, what we can require. Uh, and, uh, and what we can require of our guests. And whether or not they will agree to the restrictions. Um, you know, it's ironic because we also just, in, uh, we also just, uh, installed metal detectors for the first time. Mm. Uh, we never have had to, we never have had them before and we introduced them this year as well. So it was kind of an interesting mix of masks and metal detectors that mm. we ended up having to deal with. But I would say of the 700 direct, uh, direct answer would be maybe a third will remain, um, and I think a lot of the other back of house things, things about how we manage our folks, mm -hmm. how we uh, how we keep them safe. Um, I mean, we've been really blessed, not only in the fact that we're, um, you know, we are doing well based on our peers, but um, we've had really a very low uh, contraction rate uh, in regard to our hosts. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I think uh, there have been, um, you know, we still have 3,000 employees, 3,000 plus employees. I think we've had about two dozen cases of COVID and that's about it since we reopened in June. And we've gone through the whole tracing procedure and all of that, that stuff. Uh, that's a pretty low percentage for day-to-day uh, -day contact with thousands of people. This comment might cover you. So uh, one second. Yeah, it almost does. Rahul says, glad to hear the measures will remain. I visit theme parks often. First time I visited without having anyone get sick on a trip was thanks to safety measures implemented. Same as Asians continue wearing masks after SARS. I believe it would be a good idea to keep those in. Yeah, I mean, communicable disease is communicable disease. But don't go anywhere, Pete. Uh, we have more. We want you to stick around if you can. And I do want to sure. say that Dollywood has been ahead of the game in so many ways. In like so many ways. First moved here. My younger son is on the autism spectrum and Dollywood is the only theme park. And we were in Florida for eight years. The only theme park that said, hey, if you've got someone on the spectrum, come to guest services. We have like a guide and some stuff that will help you, you know, navigate the park in a way that's yeah, we you know, have more friendly. Now at both parks. Yeah. Amazing. So, okay. Don't go anywhere. Love you to pieces. Stick around, Pete. We're going to put you back. We're going to do a little bit of uh, thanks to our sponsors and all that. And then Mickey Kendall comes on. Yay. Wow. Wait till you find all of this. Uh, really great. And also good to hear that things are going well there. She's a, she's a wonderful woman who has built a great brand around her. That, that Dolly lady. All right, listen, we are sponsored, you know. We're sponsored by what? StreamYard. Yeah. I just got <laughs> I thought nice... we just left StreamYard because we talked about it for a long time before they sponsored. I just got another 16 bucks from them. So. <laughs> <laughs> Watch out, boys. Uh cbrogan.me slash StreamYard. You can make your own show just like this, and you can get some other people from some other theme parks to come and talk to you. Yes, you but they won't be as good as Dollywood because that one's the best one. What can you do? You might find someone else who's got a graphic novel and an incredible uh, origin story, but you're not gonna find Mickey Kendall. You're going to have to work really hard to that. You'll have so to go through her people. Get your own damn show. <laughs> Seabrogan.me slash stream or do it. Authors, if you're the nice kinds of people who write books, somebody out there has to, you can go to pub-site.com to make your own author website. It is so fast, so easy, so inexpensive. It's ridiculous. You're not going to believe it's butter. 
See, you did that all by yourself. It's so good. It. And <laughs> what I love about it is it's powered by FSB Associates, which is a book publicity firm, the best in the business. They've been around 25 years. They've worked with authors. They know what you need on a website to promote yourself, your appearances, your book. And they also know that you don't want to build a website. <laughs> so they made it just stupid easy. So pub-site.com, it's just, there's a 14-day free trial. And after that, it's just $19.99 a month. And if you absolutely don't want to build a website, like you don't care how easy it is, you don't want to, they'll do it for you for $499, which is crazy cheap. So pub-site.com, it works amazingly and it's got everything you need as an author. And sponsors a person of the day. Yay. So, oh, look, right. another reason to love Dollywood. Cool to hear. Carrie O'Shea, we're going. And he says with $16, you can buy a lot of apples. I, I think sure he's- can implying that you should supply the person of the day supply with the apples with the apple yeah you know i'll tell you i'll tell you one absolute fact about me i have a strange uh mental block to mailboxes and post offices so i cannot get to a post office it takes me months so if i say i'll send you something i almost never really mean it because well i mean you, it in my you heart can, like click and ship right you know that if you know how much the thing weighs like just get like a postal scale and then you slap a label on it and they just take it from right where you are you just said words <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna get Mickey Kendall up on here and But you you can though. We're gonna talk about that. I mean, yes, I can. I also can't play basketball poorly and sadly. Mickey, can you help us? Yeah, step in, be my friend. Hello to you. <laughs> Hi. Um, unfortunately, Chris, I have to tell you, I cannot help you because I too don't like the post office. So my solution was to find a post office that nobody ever really seems to go to and go and do my shipping on days when no one is there. When no one's around. For some weird reason, especially on like Tuesdays and Wednesdays, I'm giving away a secret. Those, tiny tell anybody. Offices, those little like mall, strip mall post offices. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I'm in with you. All right. Mickey, I have a question. What do people most identify you as? An author? an activist, which, which of the pile of Mickey's out there do you most end up being when people shake you down for information and stuff? Um, probably the mean one, actually. <laughs> the mean one? Yes. Yes. So what's mean Mickey? I'm a big fan of mean people. What do you got? Oh, um, I have this thing. So I was that kid, the know-it-all kid, you know, the one with the hand in school. Yeah. Just gonna confess now. My nickname was books. I was a total nerd. I have a book tattoo. Like I am a serious yes. Nice. So when people say you don't know what you're talking about or whatever, or they want to shake me down for information, I am a fountain of facts and useless information, but sometimes there's useful information. So I turn into the resource librarian, the one really mean resource librarian that like barrages you with like links and information and here's the numbers. And people are just kind of like. <laughs> <laughs> Time out, code red. <laughs> no. I will throw box facts at you. I will, I confess. <laughs> so the book, I, the book I know of yours and read of yours was Hood Feminism. And the whole point of it, you know, in, in my awful reinterpretation, which you could fix because I'm bad, uh, was that basically it's a book to point out, oh, hey, there maybe are a lot of other flavors of feminism. And maybe we're not we're, we're doing a lot of disservice to a lot of people who identify as a feminist in a lot of different ways. Um, number one, how, how is that as trying to explain the book? And number two, like punch some people right now. What do we got? <laughs> so here's the thing. Kind of. Yes. But it is okay. not quite that gentle. Okay. You made me sound so much nicer. I than do. My I do. You did. Um, <laughs> I was very much, um, at one point in the book, I described myself honestly as an asshole because I kind of am. Everybody so, is sometimes, Mickey. Come on. Right. Nobody is 100% an asshole, but everybody is sometimes. I, there, are, there are politicians. I would disagree with that. I would say that they are 100%. I'm just <laughs> uh, I stand corrected. <laughs> Anyone who knows me can guess which one I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. He is orange. Um, or or he fantasized about ending Medicare. And that's the, the sentence he's told you. Either or. Either or. Um, but um, no. So it is specifically calling out what mainstream feminism is doing because we are, we have a lot of the, the industry, the machinery is there. 
We seem to be determined to aim it everywhere, but at problems that affect most women. Um, and part of my thing has been with this book to say, hey, so when you say we need women support, that can't be a one way street. You're gonna have to support other women. And by that, I mean trans and non-binary folks too, just so we're clear. Right. Um, and we're going to have to talk about things like hunger and police brutality and housing and all of these things, not as separate issues that are not feminist issues, but is in fact integral parts of what feminism should be focusing on because we cannot say, oh, well, we should be competing to be CEOs. Not enough women are CEOs without talking about how many women can't afford to pay their rent, especially at times like right now, about yeah. how many people are in communities that are absolutely being beaten down by things like whether we're talking about lead in the water in Flint, or we're talking about brownfields, or we're talking about asthma clusters, or we're talking about the police, because I am from Chicago, right? where we have one of the only, I think we have the only police torture center in the United States of America because we had a long running case of torture. We still have a black site. So women are going into these places. We're not doing enough for them. Torture, like an yeah. actual torture site. Well, Raul says, I've embraced the fact that I'm an asshole on occasion. It's made life a lot easier. Getcha. It's, it, it works so much better if you just own it, right? I tell people all the time that I am not nice and they continue to say surprising things when I exhibit that and they're like, what? But I thought you were nice. I'm like, I never said that. Um, you, you mentioned uh, briefly, and I want to double back on it, trans feminism, uh, non-binary feminism and all that. That's one of the areas where there's been incredibly volatile scenarios that happen. And also, of course, uh, the difference between white feminism and people of color feminism and how the fact that that doesn't always get handled especially well. And there's a, you know, the easiest slang of it all. There's so many Karens and not enough everybody else's right now. That seems to be a challenge, right? Well, and part of it is that um, I'm going to say this thing that I think people forget when we talk about Karens. Remember those images of Ruby Bridges and the women hurling things at her and screaming and other children integrating schools? Those women had children at home. Those women raised their children. Their children have names like Karen. So when we sort of present Karens as this isolated incident, I always kind of, because I'm a Chicago girl from the South, so I'm always like, actually, <laughs> um, there are a lot of them. They do things like push to keep schools segregated, even if they're not segregated by law, they are segregated in practice. They back politicians who cut funding. You know, Chicago lost over 200 schools in 20 years. The vast majority of those schools that were removed were removed from the South and West sides. The majority, yeah, thank you. Um, the, the majority of the schools that were shut down were in low income neighborhoods of color. And so then when we say, well, that's not a feminist issue, it's like, well, the women who benefit from feminism the most are the women who in the, helped enact those policies and enforce those policies. So one of the reasons I call that out is that when we're talking about, for instance, trans women, um, non-binary, uh, gender, uh, queer folks, what we're talking about. I thought you said gingers and I was like, what? No. <laughs> I get discriminated against all the time. No. Sorry, as you were. Um, no, but, um, about gender queer folks is that we're really talking about people who are in communities where they are expected to toe the line of white supremacy um, or to fall into whatever other boxes, right? Let's say they're in communities of color, whatever. And they are navigating transphobia, trans misogyny. And then on top of all of that, they've still got to deal with racism, hunger, right? Because trans. What we're, uh, trans women of color are their average age is 30 of death is 35, right? They have the lowest life expectancy. When we're talking about job protections, equal rights, largely, if you are trans, you are still locked out in many states from being protected from losing your job. This is also true for other members of the LGBT spectrum. I'm not saying that it's not true for other groups, but more advances have been made even within the LGBTQ community for other groups than for trans people legally in terms of protections, right? We've just seen this with um, <laughs> our, our current administration deciding that transitioning is a reason that you cannot join the military. You know what is a great way if you are in a low income community and you have a not so great situation at home to join get out at high cost? It's to join the military. 
-hmm. You don't close that door without knowing what you're closing that door on. Because let's be clear here. Uncle Sam actually does not spend that much money on medical care because frankly, Uncle Sam is providing the bulk of its own medical care to itself, right? We don't join and become, I don't know, paper pushers. I mean, some people do, but I was a medic. Right? People join and they become nurses, they become doctors. There's no associated greater risk of cost there than any other condition. So we know what we're doing when we make these decisions. And then we say, well, those aren't feminist issues. And it's like, well, actually, yeah, they are. And if we're not going to talk about those issues, when the crap that's rolling downhill lands on only 6% of, of companies are, uh, only 6% of CEOs are women. There we go. That's the word I was looking I have for. to go, Mickey, but I don't want you to think it's because I disagree with anything you're saying. But yeah. Oh, bye, Carrie. Bye, bye, bye everybody. See you. Listen to Mickey. Mickey is good. Mickey is wise. It's because they're going to stop listening to the video leave. Uh, <laughs> see you, Carrie. <laughs> Um, and in, in a minute, I'm going to bring back Pete too, uh, because we're gonna do a little bit of a panel thing, but I wanted to, I wanted to flip like at least 90 degrees and talk about the other Mickey candles. Cause people don't know, but you do a lot of fiction authoring as well. So yes. they don't know that you have a really cool uh, piece in steam powered lesbians, uh, steampunk stories. Steam powered, a lesbian steampunk. Yes. So not only do people have to know anything about steampunk, but it's also lesbian steampunk, which I am a, a cyberpunk guy who sort of begrudgingly appreciates some steampunk. Um, what does steampunk add or subtract to a lesbian story? Or is it lesbians who happen to be going through the steampunk experience? Did I lose you, Mickey? <sighs> I think he froze. Oh no, Carrie goes and everything froze. I'm back. I'm back. Oh, phew. Okay, that's good. Yes. All right. So, um, does does uh, does steampunk add anything to lesbianism, or does it? It happens to be lesbians in the steampunk uh, world. What is the? Um, it, it happens to be about lesbians and other other things. We're sure. Talk about slavery, some other things in a steampunk based world, because one of the things that I firmly believe is that we tend to think. Um, when we imagine these futures, alternate timelines, whatever, we tend to forget other people exist in them too. And our, our fantasy, our fiction informs our fact. So if we are seeing different people, different relationships, different experiences in our escapism, it kind of normalizes our viewpoints when we come back to our, our meat space. Interesting. And, and then just to just to make it even more interesting, uh, you also are involved in Swords of Sorrow, which has a whole bunch of other cool storylines around people like Vampirella and Red Sonia and mm -hmm. some other cool things. So you had a chance to sort of write in that genre as well. So how many people when they, they sort of see hood feminism, Mickey, don't realize just how like how much color you have floating in all directions like that? Um, it's actually really funny because people keep referring to hood feminism as my first book. And I have a book that came out a few months before it called right. Amazon's Abolitionists and Activists. I wrote two books in one year. Not because because that's what you do, right? Yeah. So sleep sleep is a is a is a thing. Um and then after Hood Feminism came out, I had another project with um God, I am cereal box. It is early. Um, but with Serial Box Pub in uh, a Black Widow anthology that is available for you to listen to. And then I have something else coming out that I can't talk about because I just got pushed back because COVID. Um, actually, I think I can say that it's coming out. I'm not sure when it's coming out, though. But it's uh, part of a DC anthology. Um, and so people tend to look up, because um, I've written for some RPGs and some other stuff, too, and kind of go, wait, that's not the same Mickey Kendall. And then someone says, it's her. Yes, and then sir. I occasionally get a lovely... Do you sleep? Sleep when we're dead, right? That's what I mean, saying. I am what happens when insomnia and ADD get together. Now you made me have to tell my favorite ADD joke. How many people with ADD does it take to change a light bulb? Let's ride bikes. Um, That's so, accurate, there you go. And so then I'm my... I'm really mad, but I actually have done that. Well, so then my follow on joke to that is that the ADD Association of America uh, threatened to sue me if I said that joke for like kind of a defamation, defamation and slander. And then I said, well, you won't remember. That's my awful ADD joke part two. I mean, right, is I'm, it really awful though? Nah, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's loving poking. 
So yes. I'm going to grab Pete Owens really quick and I'm going to make him come back to this storyline. Hey, Pete. Hi. I was thinking about the fact that with, with managing the park, what did we most want to talk about? We wanted to talk about the person. Is that an interesting experience as a PR person to kind of have to integrate it? Or is it more like, I feel so lucky that I have this and it's not just like six flags with a fake old man. Um, I mean, it's interesting. We're, um, you know, we're not a 160 acre Graceland. Right. So, you know, it's not, um, not it's a not, shrine. All, yeah. I mean, it's not all about Dolly. So it is all about the great smoky mountains of which Dolly is the most colorful thing to come out of the Smokies. But it is, uh, you know, it's about the music of which she's an integral part. It's about the food. It's about the beauty of the area. Uh, it's about, you know, the, the heritage crafts and those other things that, that we showcase. Um, and, you know, that's kind of the overarching, you know, master brand of it. And then, we obviously have things that tie directly to her from an entertainment perspective. We just launched a new show for a Christmas festival that has her nieces doing songs, Christmas songs that are either she wrote or either Dolly wrote or her nieces wrote uh, or are traditional. So there's a direct tie to that. And this is really the home base of the imagination library and the home base of her, uh, um, you know, of uh, her museums called Chasing Rainbows. That's where all her awards are and a lot of those kind of things. So sure. if you're a Dolly fan, this is really the place to go. But if you're just a theme park fan um, or you really want a good experience for you and your family, um, that's really what we lean on. She had an interesting or, or, or exhibits an interesting connection and a very positive one with the LGBT community. Uh, I didn't add all the extra letters. I apologize, but we get it. Uh, QIA plus. Um, but she said a couple of things. One of two of my favorite quotes of hers. One is that, you know, she's lucky she was born a girl because she would have just been in drag all the time. She, she loves drag. She's she sees her look as a drag look. Um, does that in any way translate to the park? Is there any kind of a connection to that whole LGBTQ space in the park or no? Um, you know, I think the, uh, probably not, I mean, probably not overtly, I think is probably the, the right answer. Sure. Um, but you know, everything that she, her spirituality, her belief system, uh, how she treats other people, mm -hmm. all of those things are part and parcel with what the experience is here. We, um, you know, we're a welcoming environment. We uh, are, um, well, I mean, we've won the Golden Ticket Award for the friendliest park or now from an operational standpoint, the, nice. I think they call it, oper you know, the operational award, which is friendliness and cleanliness um combined uh over the last decade uh, every year for the last decade uh and uh it's important to our host i mean we want to treat people the way that they want to be treated and that includes all people um right. and certainly dolly is um i think the key about dolly and i'm i don't speak for her but i can repeat what she has said and it is, and what's key to Dolly is that she does not judge anyone. Right. She is, she does not see that that is her place. Um, and the, and so the, in any particular situation doesn't have to necessarily be, you know, we're talking about, uh, um, you know, LGBTQ folks now, but I mean, sure. it, any, but anyone, she doesn't judge anyone. Right. And uh, and so and she's welcoming to everyone. And I think that that's a really great lesson for everyone to learn. I'm with you on that. Mickey, I just had this thought about, you know, when the world opens back up, Lord knows what century that'll be uh, when the world opens back up. You know, here we here we have Pete who runs a park. Um, where do you want to go that we can't go to right now so easily? Oh man, I want to go everywhere. To be fair, um, I have friends, so I have to I have to preface this by saying that my grandmother was one of Dolly Parton's biggest fans, so uh, I grew up on a lot of Dolly. Uh, 
you will find a lot of black people who grew up on a lot of Dolly. The Dolly is definitely quite true. A lot of girls, right. Um, but um, I want to go. So I just want to go somewhere else. Like I'm currently just in Illinois. Else. I just want to. I love Illinois. Don't get me wrong. But I have friends in Tennessee, so we could go to Dollywood. We could go to Florida. We could go to Iceland. I want to go to South Korea. I want to go to Canada. I've reached the point where I'm like, I have a passport. Please let me in. Please let me out. This gone. This has gone on so long, and I know we probably. For safety reasons, we'll be doing this well into 2021 and possibly early 2022. Wear your mask, mm -hmm. wash your hands. You're right about that. All right, listen, we're at the last part of the show and we have a couple things to do. I got to do a person of the day. A uh, person of the day is sponsored by PubSite, pub-site.com. You can get your chance to connect up. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to give it to Mitch Jackson. I don't know if he's still hanging out, but Mitch Jackson's our uh, other resident lawyer friend who runs a lot of shows. Uh, but he stopped by and graced us today. So, hey, Mitch, you get an apple just like that one you see on the screen. You just got to go to a store and pick it up yourself because um, I don't ship. And uh, you are a person of the day. Welcome, Mitch Jackson. Uh, last question of this entire event is the backpack question, which is what goes in your backpack? So Pete and Mickey, this is, we're living in a world of shifting sands, as both of you know quite well. Uh, nothing is solid anymore. Everything that was a foundation is in question. We have to try to figure out what we're going to do for the next five years. You get to put one thing in the backpack. There's, it's already full of other guest stuff. So, I mean, there's almost no room now. Um, you could put something physical. You could put something metaphorical. You could put something like, uh, hope or uh, aspiration or, or kindness or whatever, curiosity, grumpiness, uh, or you can put something physical, my favorite, an avocado. So I will start with Pete Owens. Pete, what goes in the backpack? Um, as Since we're looking toward the future, I would say, and we can say things that are not necessarily physical items, I would say civility. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, I'll take it. What do you got, Mickey? Um, I am actually going to say equality and inclusivity. I'm putting two things in the backpack. Um, See, people do that. Because civility is a lot easier to achieve when um, no one is being oppressed. I like it. I can do with it. Raul says, by the way, that Disney's still taking forever to remove remnants of Song of the South. And I applaud Dolly for removing the name Dixie and the Dixie Stampede. I'm sure that was a bit of work, too, as soon as she realized that it could be considered offensive. And there's definitely. Definitely that. So Scott uh, says, uh, Coach Scott Woodard says that there's always room in the backpack for new stuff. I know, but I want to make them feel the crush of it. So um, one thing that I didn't warn Pete about, but he'll catch on awful quick, I hope, is that uh, I had to talk to you about what my grandmother thought about Dolly Parton because uh, my grandmother liked heavy metal, which is absolutely true. She had a Judas Priest album. She, had, uh, she liked Twisted Sister because it came out in the 80s, and she thought that was pretty funny. But one thing she said about Dolly...